Okay, so let me see if I got this straight. In the industry, when professional production units are doing short form documentaries or long form journalism, they often have production teams of between four and 44 people. So you're telling me you want to take a class of 16 college students, have them work in groups of three or two, or in some cases, one on their own individually and produce industry level content in 15 weeks while still under pandemic protocols? Yeah, I think a college journalism students can do that. Don't take my word for it. Hi, my name is Breck Snow. Um, I am a fourth year at Ithaca College and I'm on the crew team. Um, I'm a chemistry anthropology double major and I use they them pronouns. My name is Kelsey Lavin. I'm a junior at Ithaca College. Uh, I'm a physical therapy major and I'm on the rowing team and I'm gay. My name is Sienna. I am 19. Uh, I identify as bisexual. How can I be who I am? How can I be my authentic self if I know or I worry that the people I'm currently living with won't be supportive, right? A lack of family support or a lack of acceptance or sometimes actual actual rejection, those kinds of things really take, can take a toll on someone's mental health. I came out twice. So my first time coming out was that freshman year in high school where they kind of found out and were asking me questions about it, but um, they found out I had a girlfriend and were asking me all these questions that I didn't really have the answers to at that time. I didn't feel like I had sat with it enough and like thought about things enough to like answer to other people or even to myself. So uh, it was kind of like, and I don't know. And so my parents kind of told me like they were really receptive with it. They said that like they love me no matter what, but they kind of told me it was like the phase that like, that's the answer that I got there. Like. Um, it's a phase reaction. And then uh, my senior year in high school, I started dating this other girl. And that's for sure when I was like, yeah, like I'm definitely gay. And then they were like, oh, okay, well, we love you, so. Family is supportive in general. They obviously like, you know, mess up with my name a lot and the pronouns a lot, um, but it's not for lack of trying. Overall, my family, you know, they're kind of just like, yeah, like whatever you feel comfortable with, like whatever you're doing, like I'm not gonna tell you no, like I'm not gonna tell you it's wrong. They're homophobic, they're a little homophobic. Not very, not so much that, that they'd be putting me at risk, but like they'll make um, comments in passing um, about me hopefully marrying a man and settling down and I'm like, I don't know. I don't think men like that. And there's so many ways that families can respond negative, negatively, even when they don't want to. Even when they want to be supportive, sometimes they're misguided in how they respond. You know, there's a continuum of, of ways that that can, can have an impact. I want to say that it hasn't really um, affected my relationship to my sexuality too much. But um, anytime that I felt like any urge to explore my gender identity or express um, any kind of like variance in um, how, like, present, how I present, like even if I choose to be in like more masculine presenting or androgynous, I do get some pushback from those people in my life. And that has been really frustrating because it's almost like I'm being pushed back into the closet. Unfortunately, sometime, sometimes we do have to stay in the closet for our own personal safety in some situations in life. And that hurts a lot. Some, for some people, much more than others. I think one of the most difficult things is that it it means they have to hide have to hide a, a, an important part of who they are and that can create a sense of feeling disconnected from oneself 
a message that says it's not okay to be who you are. The person who hears that message can walk away thinking something's wrong with me, feeling hurt, disappointed, angry, confused. Where do I go from here? The pandemic has just really magnified and shined a bright light on all of the inequities and the injustice that already exists in society. Students, young people, um, students of color, LGBTQ students, and all of the intersections of those folks um, are bearing the brunt of COVID-19 more um, than folks who don't experience marginalization or folks who have more power and privilege in society. When everything literally came crashing to a halt and we were suddenly like shipped home and not doing school and not rowing and not able to leave our houses, it was just like at a point where it just felt like an emergency. It felt like I had to do something about it and I had to say something about it because it was affecting me so much. Mm -hmm. When I transitioned from high school to college, I became more of myself, but now like when I go home on breaks, I still feel like I'm myself at home. But I feel like when I came to college was when I really like started acting like myself. Um, I think being home during the pandemic was the most time that I've spent home with myself since I was like 13 since I went to boarding school. So it was very, um, it felt like I was spending a lot of time just like looking at myself in the mirror. In my high school, I was like one of three LGBT people in my high school. And then I came to college and I was like, yeah, like I have a girlfriend and people were like, oh, you're gay, like that's so cool. And I feel like people liked me more because that I was gay. Like they were just like, oh cool, like hang out with us. The pandemic, interestingly enough, has like forced a lot of people to come out. You don't have to constantly put on makeup, do your hair, and put on like a very specific outfit every day to perform femininity um, without even questioning if that's what you're comfortable with. Whatever you're feeling is valid and that you shouldn't have to you shouldn't worry about what other people are gonna think because you're judging yourself so much harsher than anyone else ever will. And unfortunately, sometimes the people that we love do not love us back the same way we want them to. And because of that, we have to find other places to be fulfilled in our lives. They just like wanted answers and I couldn't give it, give answers to them. Um, I think they did a good job like stressing like that they love me and like that nothing's gonna change. There will be people that love you for your full self and not just some fragmented part of you. Even in the face of all of the challenges that the pandemic has uh, you know, created for all of us, many people are coping well. And you know, maybe experiencing those, those things, the, the anxiety, the depression, the grief, but also finding ways to cope. LGBTQ folks are pretty resourceful and resilient. And the fact that some of our community members have found like a silver lining of this is, I mean, really speaks to what our, what our community has always been about is like, finding those those cracks to be able to be who we are During a pandemic, it is really scary. It's scary enough just opening a restaurant in general, but during a pandemic, it was kind of, I honestly, I don't know why no one stopped us. <laughs> like no one was like, yeah, you shouldn't do that. I was like, yeah, you should definitely do that. I didn't start a business in Ithaca when there wasn't a pandemic going on. And so I don't really think I have a good like frame to judge it against, um, but it's been, 
I think better than I expected. I was, we had like a very long hiatus of not being able to open um, for various reasons and technical things. Um, and then it was just sort of like, okay, we like need to get open. And I think people are just like so appreciative of having a place where they can go, um, even though it's not, you know, exactly how we thought it was gonna open. We don't have people like hanging out in here and that sort of thing. Um, we've had a lot of people tell us that this is like their first coffee outing since the pandemic began, which is just like a real honor for them to, to choose us to come in and get that first cup of coffee that they didn't make themselves. So it's definitely been encouraging that we're still like getting the turnout, even though there is still this big scary thing going on that's definitely affecting lots of stuff. I've always had lung issues since I was a baby. Like I, I, I have a COPD, like it's why also I wanted to be sure that I was able to find some form of employment, be it self-employment, that I could take care of myself as well should anything go, go wrong. When we signed the lease on this place, I was like, all I know is I want something bright, something fresh, something Super simple, uncluttered, um, and I want people to walk in and feel like, oh, am I in? Am I in Ithaca? I just wanted it to be a really like serene, welcoming space. We wanted it to be kind of like in a little oasis, um, it, like just in the midst of you know whatever is going on. I'm Maddie Segrishi. Um, I own Botanist Coffee House. And I came up with the idea with my collaborator, Stacy, who owns the Ithaca Flower Shop. When we first opened, like the first weekend was awesome. Everybody was like coming out for sure. They were super excited that we had finally opened after such a long time. Um, we did a little soft opening the two days before with just like family and friends and people who'd been following the project for a while. Um, and so that went really well and kind of helped to get the word out. Um, and so definitely was busy to start um, and it's been steady ever since. We definitely have really busy weekend days, Friday, Saturday are always really good. Um, and then people are definitely starting to sort of realize that we're here. We start, we open at seven o'clock in the morning and so we've got like some morning regulars and definitely people throughout the day for sure. So it's been really good. So I have worked in coffee basically uh, for the last 10 years consistently. Um, I moved back from Denver about two years ago and I was working in coffee out there, but um, just was looking for a new coffee home. Hound and Mare is named after my sister and my Chinese zodiac animals and the Chinese zodiac kind of how horoscopes are by the month and so my sister is the hound and I am the mare. Honestly there is a third sibling in the mix which is my little brother. He's a little bit upset that he's not in the name um, the sheep so I've been trying to find somewhere to hide a sheep in the store. I haven't really found a place yet but um, it was actually my brother, my little brother and mine, like our idea. And then he's actually in Brooklyn though. And my sister lives here. So it kind of just went hand in hand that she ended up being kind of my partner here. I've been a baker and a barista for probably eight years or so now. Um, I worked at another, um, bakery cafe in Ithaca for a number of years and then I worked for Coffee Mania who now actually roast our coffee for Botanist um, and even before I worked like in this sort of industry I've always loved baking and I sort of had a seed idea that I wanted to maybe start like a baking or coffee truck one day um, was sort of a very like long-term plan uh, and then Stacy who I mentioned um, who owns the Ithaca flower shop that used to be full-time in this space she was kind of hatching a plan to open another location in Cortland. Um, that would be her home base. And we just kind of put our heads together. Um, we had met when she did the flowers for my wedding and had stayed friends. Um, and we just thought this would be a really great spot for a coffee shop. And then we also just, both of us, of course, um, love plants. And we thought it would be a really great sort of marriage of two things that we both really enjoy. I do everything. <laughs> um, I didn't have a head, I don't have a head cook or a head chef, I don't have a head baker, everything is from my little brain. 
And I did work at a bakery briefly in Los Angeles, so I learned some tips and tricks there. But this is really just food I like to eat. And it's just really simple food made with really good ingredients. All my sandwiches are named after neighborhoods or streets in Los Angeles. And then my cookies and some of my baked goods are named after men in my life. Not necessarily men that I've actually dated or have any romantic relationship with, just men in my life. Like one's after my dad, one's after my nephew, and then two are after two of my really good friends. Other than it being really expensive to start a business, starting a business during the pandemic is even more expensive um, because there's a lot of things that we had to reevaluate in terms of system, sanitization, um, and a lot of logistical things. So this space is actually, the occupancy is like about 44 people, I think, or something like that. We're limited to two, four, six, eight. There's 10 seats in here. So um, we do every other table here, and then we have two window tables, and it's been really difficult. I put signs everywhere and nobody wants to read them and nobody, and everybody wants to come out of the pandemic. Everyone wants to get back to normal. Um, and I get that, but it's, um, it's really hard when people don't like kind of stick to the rules. Well, I think um, it's probably obvious to a lot of people that there's like a huge financial risk just in general, um, because I hadn't opened before the pandemic like officially started. Um, I'm not eligible for a lot of the sort of like relief things that are coming through. Um, although I do have a small business administration loan, which um, has had some deferment, which is really helpful. Um, but just the long delay of thinking we were going to open in 2020 and then not actually being able to open until 2021 um, definitely puts a little sort of tweak in the financial situation just because you're not really able to plan the way that you would have been able to plan had we opened on time. On time. Um, so it's just sort of like a big aura of the unknown and just kind of like going day to day and week by week and just like making sure that we're covering our bases. The aspect of it of like regulations and um, sanitizing and all of that is definitely like an added layer that we have to think about. Um, but also something that I feel like people in this sort of industry are sort of used to doing to a degree anyway. And so it's just sort of like, you know, remembering that we have that like extra responsibility to make sure everything is being conducted safely and that we're, you know, washing our hands a ton during the day and sanitizing things. So um, definitely more things to think about, but I feel like it's just like sort of breaking us in to prepare for maybe post pandemic and being like busy later on. I think that it's gone really well. All of the like protocols that are in place make me feel a lot safer. Um, I am also, as of today, actually fully vaccinated past my, like two weeks past my last one. So that makes me feel a lot better. I mean, I'm fully vaccinated, thankfully, like officially two weeks after the second dose. It's been an uptick. It's looking a lot more promising as people are more comfortable gathering within their vaccinated pods now and people are able to actually confirm, I mean, with, with their cards and everything, that, that that the risk is lessened, but still there, and don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's, <laughs> we're nowhere near anywhere that's considerably safe, to, to me at least, but um, it's definitely on the upswing. It's definitely looking towards the positive. So we did it and so far it's been good. We've been really well received and everyone's getting their vaccine now. So hopefully this is kind of us turning the bend. It was draining, it was emotionally um, daunting, it was devastating. And, you know, I think that was, the, that was the day where I said, you know, I don't know how much longer I really can keep doing this.
I just will never forget the the fear and and I just I'm I, I I'm speechless. After that, I've had a couple restraining orders for people. You have to prepare yourself that you are going to see something that you wish or thought that you'd never have to see in your entire life. The son who held his brother's head in his arms while he bled out, like the worst day of his life, 24 hours later. And he was sobbing, talking about his brother. And I was sobbing. I remember it was a couple of minutes before I was going live and the police officer came over to me and he's like, I'm just going to stand by you because I see a man near us with a gun. And then my producer's in my ear and she's like, 30 seconds. I, I grew up as an Air Force brat. I lived overseas for the first 18 years of my life. So all that traveling and being in different countries and seeing you know, firsthand what the reporting was going on in those countries and then witnessing some current events as well, um, it shaped my curiosity. I told myself I'm never gonna work in news while I was in college. I don't want to make little social media videos of uh, you know the dog and the duck that are BFFs. Like that's really cute, but that's just not what I wanted to do. For me, journalism is an, is an opportunity to tell the world's stories and to get to know people. It is a huge responsibility um, and also a huge privilege to do this job because you have people's stories in your hands and at the end of the day, you decide how you're gonna tell that story. And you can't show emotion when you're on TV at all. So you let the story just do it for you. So um, dealing with that comes through and on your writing and how you tell it. The best journalists are people first. And I've carried that with me to this day. I think people forget as a journalist, I mean, you have the, the highest highs are so high and the lowest lows are so low. It's just a lot and it's just so like, you get in the motions and you're just doing it and doing it and doing it. But then when you take a second to step back and you're like, oh my gosh, I just did all of that today. How did I physically do that? I don't know, <laughs> I don't know. It's burnt out in a way where you're tired, you're exhausted, your mind is just constantly working all the time. But to me, it's my passion and I know this is what I am supposed to be doing. I feel that in my heart. But the challenges that come with this job on a day-to-day -day basis, I wasn't expecting it to be as hard as, as it is. There's a lot of behind the scenes work that goes into what we do that people don't see, but I, I also see that as a compliment too, because we're making our jobs look a lot easier than they really are. How do you compartmentalize? How do you ask the tough questions when somebody just lost their son, maybe to drunk driving? How do you ask them questions about that. It's, it's heartbreaking. And I've had so many people say, well, it's just your job. You have to do it. But sometimes, you know, you're, you're meeting people on their worst day of their life. Kristen Morand was on the scene as police search for a suspect. The Henry County Sheriff's Office is investigating a homicide that happened at this home. It's just you come home and you're like, and you finally get to process like, oh my gosh, that just happened to me. Someone's house just burned down today and they just lost everything. And I had to cover that. I mean, I think one of the hardest days for me was covering the um, aftermath of the Sandy Hook, the Newtown school shooting. Natalie Morales is in Newtown this morning. Natalie, good morning to you. Good morning, David. Well, with exactly a week to go until Christmas, the Christmas tree here at the center of the town behind me is now a growing makeshift memorial. You see and seeing, you know, the little faces of you know, first graders who had been killed, that just crushed me. I mean, I even remember looking across at the cameraman, he was crying. And, and I was just like in shell shock all that morning. I kind of went home and I remember laying down in bed and just kind of like feeling like I, I was crushed. And then got up the next morning very early and just kind of keep going. You just have to keep going. I mean, this job is 24 seven. It is nonstop. News is nonstop. I've had days where, you know, I go home and I just I just cry because I'm like, I don't know how else to react to all the stress that I'm feeling. It's really afterwards. That's when you have to take the time for yourself and really address yourself and address your emotions. It's after that adrenaline starts to come down, you're leaving that first opportunity you get to be by yourself. 
you have to like check yourself and take that time to reset. You got to be able to stick up for yourself and say, I I just don't think it's going to work. Um, and you're going to have to push back sometimes. There's a, comes a time and place where being the best isn't always the number one priority or safety is. There have been <laughs> multiple instances where I'm catcalled, whether it's me carrying my equipment and I look like I'm struggling carrying all this equipment and a car drives by and men or whoever roll down their windows and say something or they beat their car. I mean, it's endless. And there are times when I'm sent out two hours away from my office to the middle of nowhere where cell service isn't really that good. And I have to, unfortunately, think of safety for myself. Okay, what's my escape plan? What's my escape route? What if something happens? What should I do? I was there. I was by myself. And then fights broke out. And it was almost like this huge divide between Cuban Nation police and Cuban Nation people. And there was pepper spray and I got pepper sprayed. And it was just, I found myself in the middle of this huge brawl. You have to know what your line is and you have to plant your feet in the sand where that line is and do not do anything you're uncomfortable with. And my managers were like, well, go door knock. Ask people what happened, what they thought about this police standoff. And I'm like, Absolutely not. And sometimes I have to say no. And I have to tell them I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable. I've had a couple of people where, I mean, their their name is on a list of not to let them in the building. I had somebody sending me a letter. It started with one letter a month and then it escalated to three letters a week. And I remember my managers really wanted me to go live where this flooding was. And I was like, I just don't feel safe. And they're like, okay, well, why don't you call the police department and have an officer out there with you? I remember it was a couple of minutes before I was going live and the police officer came over to me and he's like, I'm just going to stand by you because I see a man near us with a gun. And I was shocked and I was a little thrown off for that live hit. ABC 13's Kristen Moran is live in Danville with a look at road conditions there and what to expect in the hours to come. Kristen. I was like, uh, uh, uh yeah, um, so you, you can see the, 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 the flooding behind me. I was just shocked because I was like, oh my goodness, anything could happen in that moment. You know, this, the same way they tell you as, you know, parents, when you're on a flight, put your oxygen mask on you first before you take care of your children. You have to remember that when you go into these places. So you need to figure out ways to make it possible to have your health be a priority too, as well as your job. You know, I was actually assaulted um, in 2021, or in 2020 on the job, uh, covering a Blue Lives Matter rally. And they got mad that I told them to back up and they whipped me <laughs> with an American flag. I was like, how ironic that I just got hit in that back of the head with an American flag as a journalist in 2020. We actually did start hiring security, which you know, I, I remember when that decision was made. It was wonderful to have that peace of mind. But I remember another part of me thinking, is this what it's come to? <laughs> and what I did not expect, I did not expect a first impeachment. I did not expect a second impeachment. I didn't, we certainly did not expect a global pandemic to hamper all of this. And um, we also didn't expect an insurrection at the Capitol. And then I just kept seeing more and more videos of these people breaking into the Capitol. And then one of our reporters started sending pictures of bloodied Capitol police officers, which was really disturbing. And it really felt like our space had been violated. Our space had been violated. America's space had been violated. And my favorite is when somebody drives by and blows the horn and yells random profanities at you, followed by fake news. And I don't get to walk into their job and start yelling things at them. So why is it okay for people, as I'm in the middle of a taxing job, trying to make a difference in my community, why is it okay for them to yell that? Listen, there's a critic for everyone. Everybody's a critic. So you've got to have a thick skin, be ready to take it, but also be able to back it up. If people question, well, where'd you get that information? I think people can say that they don't trust the media and we're not trusted sources and that's fake news, but okay, then why are you turning on your television every day and tuning in and 
getting this information. Journalism has never been more important. We have a huge responsibility on our shoulders to to make sure people understand these are the facts. You want to make sure that a trust that a trust exists. I want to feel like I'm someone that they can turn to and trust to get their information that I'm giving out the facts. I'm giving them the facts so they can decide from that what their opinion is on the matter, because my opinion doesn't matter. My hope is that people start to trust journalists again. Um, but I'm also hopeful, like I mentioned, for the flip side of that, where journalists make themselves trustworthy again. I hope journalism continues to thrive until the day I die, and then some. I, I just hope to see an industry that feels authentic. I want to watch a story, and I want to feel that there was real care put there. But when I lay down at night, I can feel proud of, of how I've treated people on their worst day. And it doesn't ever get any easier. It really doesn't. I joined the Art Trail this year because this is a new studio space, it's a new location, and I wanted to get the word out that I still existed but in a different place. Uh, and then the pandemic came and we just got panicky. I woke up with this insatiable desire to paint, and I'd never painted before. For the first few months I was paralyzed. I literally would wake up, instead of the springy good morning, it was waking up and waiting for the next day to come so it would be over. So I wasn't doing anything. I think that everybody is inspired to create. It's a part of being a human. The pandemic has affected me as an artist. Uh, at the very beginning of this whole thing, I think basically it shut me down because I couldn't help thinking, why bother? <laughs> you know, why make this thing when people are dying? So the reason I'm drawn to flaws is because I think there's great perfection in imperfection. I think that is where most great art comes from. Knots and cracks. You know, that's all time for wood. And that's, to me, that's the beautiful part of wood. I think how the pandemic has affected me is it's put me in here all the time. And it's actually had a really positive effect on my work. When this first happened, when we when things shut down and you couldn't go and do anything and you couldn't see your friends, um, for, for many people that was a crisis. For me, it meant I had more freedom to just be in my studio. I love solving problems. So, so as an artist, you set up a problem for yourself and then you find a way to solve it. We both had an interest in the arts and um, especially an interest in the city of Philadelphia and the things that take place in the art community there. We traveled there frequently <clears throat> and um, we stumbled upon the um, Philadelphia's Magic Garden which was, I think, pretty much the inspiration of the work that I do. Yeah, and um, when I retired from <clears throat> Cornell, everybody asked me what was I going to do, and I said I was going to play with clay. And I had a little bit of a head start on Wes, and I worked in the pop shop at Cornell until they closed it down, and I learned an incredible amount from the people who were there during the day with me. We kind of walked away for a while. Yeah. And um, workshops that we would have planned to attend, mm -hmm. you know, they too Not were canceled. So the opportunity, I guess, to further grow your skill sets has been limited to a degree as a result of the closing of those workshops. Definitely. The time is there for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think the motivation has been somewhat diminished as a result of a loss of opportunity to actually show product or your work. 
When I was in my 40s, you know, there was a lot of upheaval in my life, and I needed something to focus on that was just for me. So I started to take painting lessons. Being an artist, you don't work in isolation. I, I really need to talk with other artists sometimes. And fortunately, um, for years and years, I've had a, a crit group. We get together, it used to be once a month, in somebody's house, we'd all take the art that we were working on, we would, we would look at it, we would, we would make comments about it that would be supportive and informative so that you could change things if someone saw it differently from you. We've actually established Zoom meetings for that now. Sometimes I wonder, am I losing my ability to have conversations with people? The, the really hard part was, um, you know, the State of the Art Gallery is a co-op and Susan Larkin, the president, and I um, were just inundated with having to learn new things, you know. So I kind of came out of that sort of um, wonderful beginning time where everything was slow and I didn't have any challenges to an incredibly stressful time for a couple of months because of the gallery. This gallery's been in existence for 31 years now. And, and you know, we don't want to be the ones who are leading it when it comes to a sudden demise because of COVID. The State of the Art Gallery has made a lot of adjustments because of the pandemic. Um, we used to have a large gallery and a smaller gallery. We closed the smaller gallery to make it an office space so that the people who sit there would feel safer. Uh, and we did the one-way traffic pattern with masks and, and um, all of the necessary things. But our, our visitors are down, clearly. We, we made some sales at the Art Trail last October. Yeah, we participated last October. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and we made one sale over the summer, and that's it. Normally, there's a wonderful tile and mosaic show in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, and the whole institution got shut down, um, and they don't know what they're going to do. And that was very lucrative for us. That was our main source of income. Almost everything in the gallery now uh, is this year, since the pandemic. I started transitioning to lighter things and not as rigorous. Then I started evolving to the idea that you know, hey, here we are, and we should have some pleasure while we're here. And if somebody can get some pleasure out of drinking out of a cup that I made, like, what the heck? It became a little more um, just thinking about, well, how can you get your work to people when they can't actually physically connect with you? So I developed an Etsy page, and I've started selling more online which has been great. I think that the idea that people's handmade work is being um, appreciated more uh, is an interesting sideline to the pandemic. I don't think we understand anything yet about how this is, has impacted us. People are, are gravitating because I think we've lost so much connection and humanity. I have experienced people coming in and buying art on purpose, looking for just the right piece to go in a particular area. Oddly enough, I've actually sold more paintings, not through Art Trail connections, but local people who are aware of my paintings, uh, who I think used to use their disposable income um, for traveling. They decided they were gonna put artwork in their house, so, I've had people contact me. They have come and visited and, um, and have purchased paintings and it's made us both very happy, I think. The notion that people value something that I've done just because I have to, you know, or that I want to, and want to incorporate it into their lives, I th it's very special. And it's one of these things that, make, that makes us social creatures and it makes us investigate it forces us into uncomfortable zones. There's a lot of art out there that I can be like, ew, I do not like that. But I appreciate it with every fiber of my being. And that gives me a lot of joy to, to think that someone, you know, this is gonna make somebody happy to look at it again and again. Then I, you know, it, it, it makes me happy to paint it. 
me sitting in the studio was one of my happiest times. Um, so if somebody else views it, likes it, and they get happy, we're all happy. <laughs>
this is not good. <laughs> it's untenable. Um, it's not a great balance because most of my focus is on the in-person. Truthfully, there were like it was a little difficult in the beginning because we just didn't meet him with him as much as like in-person choir did. So it was super difficult trying to communicate that. I was recording a lot of videos <laughs> and a lot of tracks. And it was definitely a lot more difficult because when you're singing in a choir, you hear the people around you, but when you're singing by yourself, you don't get the same thing. And it is it is definitely a lot more difficult to record pieces that way. And I know I struggled a lot because I'm always looking at the conductor. This is a traditional singer's mask. Um, we refer to ourselves as the duck bill choir when we put it on and you will see why in a minute. Um, but basically the purpose of this mask is on top of the extra filtration. It has a band that keeps the mask from coming into your mouth. Um, so when you are singing and forming text, you don't get the fabric in your mouth. It also has a very tight bridge for your nose, so there is no air coming out anywhere. Um, and this is required for our performances. And I've had to mold it. It's a very thick piece of wire. So I've molded it to shape my own face. And it just goes on like this to sculpt mine to fit my face. We do call it the duck bill choir because it goes very far out, but when I'm speaking or singing, there's no air coming out of any of these spots and nothing is touching my mouth. The singer's masks are definitely interesting looking. Um, it's, it's unfortunate that they actually do make singing easier because they're definitely not the most glamorous thing, but <laughs> I definitely understand why they exist. Um, it's, I don't know, it's sort of weird just to see, like, you can't really see anyone's face and like when you're performing like it's something you you want to use your face to emote and there's just big black masks on everyone and it's it's sort of like depersonalizing but it's it's a lot easier to sing in and I think that if people do have the big like singers masks it does sound better but I realize like not everyone wants to look like they're like in the black plague. Being masked especially in our concerts to remain safe I definitely feel that um, it's a lot harder to show emotion within the performance. Most of the audience is distant. And so it doesn't really affect how I am shaping a concert, but it affects um, how we perceive the performance. Like the only people that can be there are like other people that are like in the other ensemble and like even then they have to like sign up and then like show up and it's like usually there's like not a lot of people. We've been able to have some in-person audiences but it's just the other singers. I, I'm really excited. I'm definitely excited to get back into things. I'm definitely really nervous because it's just a huge jump from going online for a year and a half to going right straight back into person. <laughs> And I'm so grateful that the School of Music was able to figure out a way for us to sing together. I didn't realize how much I missed it until I didn't have it. aspect and I know like we've had a couple of rehearsals outside when the weather was permitting which was nice because... <laughs> oh, it is kind of weird that like yeah like everyone thinks that the class of 2020 is like the ones who like got the short end of the stick because literally everything that they were planning to do for the end of the year got canceled um, whereas everything that we were planning to do for the end of the year is just being adapted um, so I feel like it's it's definitely weird but I feel like if this year has taught us anything is that like we can adapt, it just takes a while um, because like we are able to have like an in-person graduation and we are able to have like in-person concerts and in-person things like that, they just have to be adapted. So I think if this year shows us anything, it's that like just because we're in a pandemic doesn't mean like 
everything has to just stop. Like it can just be adapted, which I think is really cool. Have a nice night. Beginning of the conversation starts with do you want to keep butterflies or not? <laughs> and nobody says no to that question. <laughs> I, I think everyone um, pretty much recognizes that, you know, the planet is in trouble with all the fires and out west and the floods and we've even had tornadoes here in, um, in the northeast. But what people are not really realizing is how that's impacting wildlife and insect life. When we think about the environment, we think about technology, we think solar panels, we think greenhouse gases, very physical, very STEM sorts of things. But you have to ask these questions about yeah, sociology, about values, about norms, about governance, about accountability, um, in order to understand why it feels like so many of us are screaming into the void. We need pollinators, one, because they pollinate our food sources, um, and that's really important. But in terms of um, ecology, because they're at the bottom of the food chain. And if we don't have insects, we don't have birds, and we don't have foxes, and so on up the food chain. If you, if you want to make an environmental impact, the, the first thing you should do is limit your lawn and stop leaf blowing. Don't do the gasoline leaf blowers. They are really, really tremendously bad. Plant as many trees as you can on your property. So you don't have a garden just uh, horizontally, but actually you, you get it vertically as well. You just, you know, you grow your impact in that way. The best thing to do is just plant native plants. Yeah, as many as you can. So we've been to some extent hoodwinked by various different industries that are saying, buy this refrigerator, buy this big screen TV, buy this big car, buy this leaf blower, buy this, buy that, buy this, buy that, and you're going to find your life is easier. The reality is that our lives become more difficult. You know, I live in a kind of a mature suburban community where people have yards and they have their grass and they have their, the kind of suburban look that that many communities have that has been long time an aspect of Americana and getting people to look at that differently um, think about it and understanding that just because you have a wide expanse of green grass doesn't necessarily make it a healthy community for the environment um, the suburbs are um, encroaching into woodlands and open space developers Put up houses and then they usually you know remove a lot of trees and put in lawns and lawns offer absolutely minimal habitat for wildlife and so one of the goals of our initiative is to explain to people what is happening and why it's happening and how they can play a part in uh, reversing that by offering habitat for insects and birds in their own gardens just the numbers were so frightening to us. The amount of gasoline used in the landscaping industry, the amount of pesticides. We, our, our lawns use more pesticides than any other food crop in the US of A. 86% of land east of the Mississippi um, is privately owned. So if we're not making it a home for pollinators and birds, um, you know, we're not leaving. <laughs> There's no other place for them to go anymore. So we're trying to get people to consider themselves as stewards of the land and that if you have a small piece of property, you can actually make a contribution to e an ecosystem. Really, the thing about the Pollinator Pathway is that it's like a grassroots, it is a grassroots movement. So it, it looks different in every town. Right. It, it reflects the town and the people that have stepped forward to do it there. We deliver uh, home services, we, call, we go to gardens, uh, help people uh, privately with their yards, 
and everything is done for free. Uh, if people need plants, we will go and look for them and give them to them if they cannot afford to buy them. Something about this is, you know, people are hungry for, what can I do? People are connecting with nature though. They're sitting in their yards and saying, why don't I have, I used to have more, you know, fireflies. What's up, what's up with that? And they can get excited about it because it's right outside their kitchen window. And wow, I planted milkweed and I actually saw a monarch, but there's not enough milkweed leaves for the caterpillars. I better plant more. Yeah. Yeah. If you can zoom in to your garden uh, and you can just investigate a square yard and you see that so much is going on in that one square yard and that you can actually have a huge impact on what's happening there and this is like a universum for for these little insects that really inspires me a lot so whatever makes me depressed that is always a happy place for me we do get a lot of pushback from people who are just like ew it's bug or ew i don't want to get stung once you get curiosity fear starts to move to the side that's what i've learned one kind of major societal pressure is kind of a lack of familiarity or a certain set of standards that doesn't include for maybe messier insects or buzzing insects or insects that drill. So there's lots of standards and changes in the way that we approach living with these kind of unruly other creatures um, that I think is one big piece in this broader set of changes that needs to happen to again, live more sustainably, be better neighbors, not just with people, but with the animals like pollinators that are all around us. When we drive through our neighborhoods, there's a unwritten code about how high one's lawn can be before it needs to be cut. Neighbors don't necessarily need to say anything directly to us, but they can make passing comments about some other person's house and how that house is not kept up. And then we start thinking about, well, if the person is making that statement about somebody else, what might they think about me and how I'm behaving? Um, my neighbor had a very wooded property and about three years ago, he cut down all the trees and put in a massive lawn, mm -hmm. clear cut. And then we talked and I said, well, you know, would you, do you want me to help you uh, put a few native plants on your, on your front lawn? And he goes, no, nope. I love my lawn. I want it just like this. My wife teases the heck out of me, but I grew up in a, a small suburb. My dad loved his lawn and I loved my lawn and everybody in the neighborhood had lawns. This is the aesthetic from the post-World War II era and he's never gonna change. It's really hard to see the norms that we subscribe to, I think, that we individually, personally, by definition, we think it's normal. And normal also means right and correct and, you know, best. The fear is that your yard is going to look like you just don't care and you haven't done anything. So there's some ways to make your messiness look intentional, which I think kind of can go a long way to solving the problem. One is a habitat sign, like this we're on the pollinator pathway and that's why you're seeing you know why, why we haven't cut the grass so it is about changing the aesthetic and i mean that has happened for me personally when i see a messy yard like my own <laughs> i know that you know it's early spring and so i'm waiting to clean up because the ground nesting bees have not emerged yet and so to me kind of this scraggly like little bit wild look is now so much more beautiful there's actually a very beautiful house uh, that is, um, the whole yard is wildflowers. And, and I've been watching that house for years and I've seen other houses start to emulate that. So you can have people who are pathbreakers, people who are at the leading edge and other people might start to follow. It needs to be about everybody um, and it needs to be accessible. And I definitely have pulled people from walks of life in my town that I really did not think would back me. Um, and they came out and they held that butterfly and their lives changed. You know, I actually thought the pandemic in many ways was a blessing. A lot of people rediscovered their yard. We try to do is not 
just making it us telling people things we really hope that people are going to help each other and also sh you know share plans with each other uh, talk about you know talk about this issue over over their fences with their neighbors with their town boards with the class teacher so that it's just something that's gonna start living among all of us the guy next door if he changes and he changes the guy next to him and he changes the guy down the block um, all of a sudden there's a difference so if we are the hope I mean yeah. it's it's us I think I was Googling and of course Sally's keeps coming up and I'm like, I don't mean Sally's. Um, and then I just saw like Main and Legs and I think when I was looking through the pictures, it looked familiar to me and I said, yes, those are the products I need kind of thing. I love working at Main and Legs. There's a, there's a overall sense of community um, and joy. Uh, Veron is like so silly, but like, you know, is very serious about her business, which I really respect. The Main and Wigs shop at downtown is one that I really, um, I, I've valued, I, I've bought products. I've just, and there are certain ones that I really like, you know, certain hair oils and it's just good, or the shea butters and just all of, it's just such a wonderful experience always to go in and just get such warm treatment and to be remembered even. To have that sense of recognition so that you're not a generic, no one cares or knows who you are when you walk into Target. Um, so when I um, came to Ithaca, before when I was packing, what I would usually do, and this is something that I've continued to do over the years, was stock up on products from my local beauty su supply shop just because um, in the past, I've seen some products at Walmart, but it's usually not as wide of a selection as I would get in Brooklyn going to the beauty supply store near my house. I moved to the area back in the uh, end of 2018, and I was having great difficulties getting um, hair products. Mm -hmm. And I realized that there's not any word readily accessible for hair products, especially for black folks. I wanted to be the person to make the change, so I did make the change. Way back in the 80s, I went to cosmetology school. And that's basically the only experience I have because my specialty is a nurse. I'm a registered nurse. I have a master's degree as a registered nurse and that's my life. So starting a business um, in a hair care um, product business it was um, a big step. I do think there's a lack of accessibility to hair products for black women in Ithaca with the excep exception of Maine and Wigs in the Commons. I really wasn't aware of other um, beauty supply shops until I was a senior and on top of that because I don't know how to drive or have a car I'm usually relying on other people to make those errands for me. It's just important to have a consistently friendly and accessible climate for cultivating black businesses more generally but then businesses by black women entrepreneurs, even more specifically, there's a long history of black women in the beauty business, including of the important role that black women beauticians played in the early 20th century in helping to advance and, and launch the civil rights movement because they had autonomy as um, entrepreneurs in ways that some other business owners did not been to a bank and you know try to talk it over with the 
loan specialist and um, they had a hard time trying to figure out how a business like my business would make any money. It all boils down to because of the lack of understanding and knowledge about why would you need a, a beauty supply that caters to minority and um, that they couldn't understand. So I decided to open the store on my own with my own cash. It's important to have black owned businesses Especially with hair, like that's something so personal, that's something so specific to you, um, specific to your identity as well. I've even been to like some hair stores where they don't have the consistency of my hair. They don't know the history of black hair. They know the texture of black hair. The importance of having a black owned business is that the money that is circulating is black money, <laughs> black owned money. And when you don't get that because you don't share <laughs> you don't share the history of black hair, then it just becomes, um, I'm a store owner, your money. Um, but once, you know, black businesses can assert themselves in, in, the, in the industry and, and know who they are, I think it just makes it all the more um, representative. How I feel about non-black people profiting off of black people, black customers, black hair, I think that it's a violation. <laughs> um, it's a violation and it's a violence. You're putting a price tag on our bodies. That's what you're doing. In the mainstream hair care industry, there's not been a lot of interest in or commitment to learning how to do black care techniques. Black populations are always expected to be responsive to the norms of the dominant culture, but it doesn't go both ways. Like you don't care about what you're putting into black bodies. You don't care about what's on your shelves. You don't care if it's toxins on your shelves. Like you do not have to care because now you own this market. Like, you, you're, you were able to be successful, you're able to own this market, and now when someone does come Black-owned, which should be the normal, now when someone does do that, now that's abnormal. That's the hashtag. That's, that's like, oh, you're doing something that's special, and it's just like, this is how it should be. So we have to think about how the principles of segregationism and Jim Crow manifest in these smaller ways and end up seeping in. I had an unhealthy relationship with my hair when I was younger, just because of the images that were given to me through animations, through um, dolls and things like that. So it was always supposed to be like long and flowing. And for so long, I thought I was Pocahontas because that's the closest thing I had. You witness these, these instances where some are, are just better sourced and have more choices for self-care than others. And maybe a lot of people don't necessarily think it's, it's, it's such a serious thing, but there are long-term and lasting effects when the mainstream society panders to um, a white um, centered beauty standard. My relationship with my hair is even stronger now just because I'm learning that freedom comes in whatever I want to define it as. So that can come as natural, that can come as weave, <laughs> that can come as short, um, which it is now. And yeah, it just, it, it now it's kind of like I'm in companionship instead of in resistance with my hair. We have so many students who come to this region every year and have to deal with these questions. And a lot of times find the answers on their own. I needed that because I was out here by myself. I didn't have family to like help me out with picking um, hair products or even like helping out with hairstyles. I just, I live up the street, so I just walked down, um, came here, met Varan, and again, I was able to tell her like what was going on with my hair. I think at the time I had it like cut short or something. And so I was trying to find out um, what products could I use to like to do twist outs and things like that? And so she just walked the shelves with me. We were picking out conditioners. We were picking out um, leave-in conditioners and things like that, um, earrings. So it was that's how it happened. It's it's a great spot. Like it's a great spot, and it's it's a necessary for for the black community of Ithaca, hundred percent. I've done a lot, and I've done a lot of work, and I put a lot of time and effort in there, and I try to meet the needs of the co community. However, I don't think that it's anything extraordinary for me. Mm. 
I think it should be normal standard routine whatever I'm doing that that's needed to be done it's it's a necessity it's like this is where I come for my hair it's perfectly placed as well um, right almost like in the center of downtown so accessibility is important to me the products that are being sold are important to me and like I said before like the the guidance that I get here is important to me as well. I think that when these kinds of businesses open, all of us feel um, inspired. And there's like, you know, a natural in inclination to, you know, help them to, su to succeed by doing your part. And like, you know, buying your fair share, as opposed to maybe spending dollars in businesses that don't necessarily invest as much or as personally in a black clientele. I, so I wish I would say to the bank person that couldn't understand, and not only the bank person, a representative from the Small Business Association, I could say, look at me now, it has been two years, and with all the barriers and struggles of COVID, I'm still up and running. To me, black hair is beautiful, um, unique, strong, adaptable, a crown. Good evening, I'm Jordan Norcus. Thank you for joining us for 18 News at 5. And I'm Zach Wheeler. And I'm Jordan Norcus. Thank you for joining us for 18 News at 6. Good evening, I'm Jordan Norcus. Thank you for joining us for 18 News at 10. Good evening, everyone. I'm Zach Wheeler. And I'm Jordan Norcus. Thank you for joining us for 18 News at 11. I got my bachelor's at a pretty expensive private school. I got my master's at the same pretty expensive private school and I've racked up a lot of student loans. The pay is rough when you first start and I feel like a lot of people, not even just the pay, but they don't want to put the work in. You know, like when you first start, there's so much. Like, you know what I mean? You have so, you're wearing so many different hats. You're anchoring, reporting, producing, editing. You're literally doing everything, which is, and it's great. Those are all so important skills to have, you know, like to be a true multimedia journalist. It is so valuable. Finding the passion in your work, working hard, and being a woman in this industry, you are so much more than your looks. There, you have a story to tell, and you tell that story great. I work for WETM as the primetime evening news anchor. The legislative session today has come and gone, and the governor's emergency executive powers have survived, at least for now. I work at Jim's Gym in Elmira. I'm the front desk associate, so I go around, I take care of memberships, go around cleaning, make sure everything is sanitized for COVID guidelines. I'm a bartender at Round and Thirds Sports Bar. Basic bartending duties there, and then I'm also another bartender barkeep at a brewery, Upstate Brewing Company. When those jobs are busier, because obviously it's a lot more engaging, make more money and it goes by quicker, so I don't know, I feel like the quicker, pay, the, quicker the pace of the environment, the more I thrive, I feel. So usually I set my alarm for four, um, gives me like, you know what I mean, like about, about a half hour to get myself together. Um, and today I set my alarm for three o'clock, hoping to get up early, shower, make myself look nice and presentable. And then I just kept laying there, staring at the ceiling, and then too much time passed. I was like, well, guess I'm putting on a hat today. That starts my first shift. That job is a lot cleaning based. So I'm going around sanitizing all the machines. Great in the people, meet in the community firsthand. When I was in high school, I did a lot, so I thought I worked hard, but seeing what she does here, this full-time job, you know, this is more than a full-time job because it's stressful and, you know, it's our lives. The fact that she can do that, take a nap, 
go there and still have that like smile on her face. I, I don't know how she does it, which is crazy. That's why I like to help her out whenever I can, even if it's just bringing her a coffee to get through the next couple hours. I think it's a coffee, I don't know. I couldn't really ever drink it. I'm trying to like weasel my way because like I need it. I need something. I'm like warming up with like hot chocolate espresso shots and they're kind of doing something, I guess. I've had so many people come up to me like, you, I don't know how you do it. I'm like, I don't know how I do it either. It's hard working, working, constantly working. It'd be nice to have a day off every once in a while, but I don't know. I like being immersed in the community. My whole life I've always been a performer. I love being in front of people. I started at an early age doing dance classes, I was a cheerleader, and then I really found my passion for acting and singing, so I've done that my entire life. And I actually went to school for physical therapy. I was in a three plus three accelerated doctorate program, and I liked it, but I was like, I'm not feeling passionate about this, and because I'm such a passionate person, I want to feel something. I want to feel something for my work. I like being in front of people. I like telling people stories. How can I culminate the two? I took, it was like some kind of news writing class for a newspaper as an elective, and I loved it, and I, ex I excelled at it. I was like, you know what, maybe this is something more for me, you know, more something I would in actually enjoy. And I ended up doing the switch, caught up on all the classes, and the rest is history from there. I learned from an early age the importance of managing your time and setting priorities too because when you have so much coming at you it's like okay like I need to do this 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 and this how do I decide what stuff to get done first because it could be so overwhelming so I think having all those kind of responsibilities at, at an early age kind of set me up for that and prepared me for my future to come. I feel like between all four of my jobs, they are all so community-based. If anything, I feel like once they, they see me out, not only getting to know the community, but actually working with the community, they almost have more respect for you. It almost like makes, they're like, oh wow, like you're a real person. Like you're actually like, you're making my favorite drink or like you're cleaning the treadmill. Some people come and they just do the job and move on, but she again has all these eggs in different baskets, you know what I mean? So she is leaving an impression on everyone, people that don't watch the news. You know, not everyone that comes to the gym watches the news. They know her from the gym. Not everyone from uh, the bar watches the news, so they know her as that. I think it makes it even harder thinking about how other people think it's glamorous, you know. We don't get the makeup artists, we don't have the hairstylists. We're lugging our equipment around ourselves, you know, most of the time you're a one-man band. A lot of the stories we cover aren't glamorous, you know, we can do a lot of hard stuff. The U.S. has now surpassed 500,000 COVID-related deaths, but it goes back to, you know, like I said, the pay isn't great, and it's a, it's, it's a reality, it is what it is. And Jordan. Well, thank you for joining us for 18 News at 5. But don't go anywhere. Your 5 Living News is happening right now. You have a burden on your shoulder sometimes and it's sometimes it's hard to get past I call them my, my funks I get them every once in a while everyone does especially now with COVID mental health is like so important you know and everyone it takes a toll on everyone somehow whether it's big or small but I think it's you know matter of remembering what you're doing is important the work you're doing is important but I know it'll pay off in the future I know I'm putting in my time now and it's gonna have such a big payoff for years to come each job that she does, she's still the same Jordan Norcus, so everyone knows that. I am who I am, you know, it's my personality. I'm not, you know what I mean, I'm not going to put up a front and be like, all right, I'm News Jordan today. Oh, today I'm bartender Jordan, or today I'm sanitarial, like, front desk Jordan. I'm always me. And I feel like that's why I feel like I have such a great relationship with the community, because I, I don't know, I'm just always myself. And like, I love to get to know them and have them get to know me, vice versa, you know? It's a, I'm a very open book with them. So, I'm always Jordan. Growing up, my mom 
would send us the lunch, and it was everything my brother liked. She knew I didn't like fig newtons, and she knew I didn't like bananas, and she knew I didn't like peanut butter and jelly. What else did she do? Did I get that? That was my lunch? Yes. I hid them behind radiators. You know when you have that feeling, you can't quite explain it, but it's just like a deeply embedded feeling like, I know I'm going to be successful. I, I know I was put on this planet to do something and make a difference. And for me, that's telling people stories. So you got to push yourself. I and mean, that's, that's how you grow, by pushing yourself, jumping out of your comfort zone. You find out new things about yourself. You grow so much and you shock yourself in the best way possible. Who is the star? Well, if, it's, if the camera's on me. <laughs> Stop. How'd I do? <laughs> I was waiting until you said it. I can redo it. I have legs. How'd I do? <laughs> she, she gets up here and goes. Looks dead at the camera. <laughs> How did I do?